All right, so it's 105. Let's go ahead and get started. We got, uh, I think, 70 minutes or something like that. Uh, and we got a lot of material to cover, a lot of simple demos embedded in this whole topic. So um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Roberto Hernandez. Um, thank you for coming to this presentation. And uh, I've been coming to Nova Code Camp for a while, I believe, uh, probably since 2008, maybe. So here, having fun. And I've actually found two jobs here. That's another good, I guess, side story. All right. But um, this contact information that is right here, I mean, I don't want to dwell too much on it. It is going to be part of the last slide also. And everything that I'm going to be uh, showcasing today is going to be uh, up at uh, bitbucket.com slash overwrite this. That's going to be corrected in the last slide. And the slides are also going to be available as part of uh, speaker deck. So uh, before we get into that, so uh, long story short, I'm a consultant, probably like uh, most of you in the room. And whenever we approach a client, uh, we always try to find room for improvement. And it is a common theme. It has been a common theme for uh, probably since I began in consulting. And one of the areas where we can actually help the client a lot is by helping them improve their software development lifecycle. And by that, I mean their basic deployment pipeline, their, how they build their software from uh, coding, committing it to their source repository, and deploying out to whatever their target environment is. So today, uh, we're going to be talking about one of my pet peeves, which is right-click deployments. I've um, actually been at enterprise uh, clients where uh, they've been very adamant that right-click deployments are right for them. Well, I haven't found that to be truth uh, in practically all cases. So right-click deployments, uh, and we could actually do a demo here. Why not? Uh, so it's a deployment strategy that comes directly built in into Visual Studio, right? So if I just, let's say, go ahead and switch. And I'm going to build a quick project just to get it up and running. So let's call it right-click deployment. A small core application just because it's going to be quicker to get out there. And here we are. Uh, right click publish. So that's what basically we're talking about right click deployment. And it serves a purpose. For example, one client once told me, like, why are right click deployments so bad if there's an option in Visual Studio? Where well, there are scenarios where this is applicable. Um, if you're a lone wolf developer working on a project, uh, then maybe right-click deployments are right for you. If you're working on a small team that basically doesn't, uh, is not uh, have access to deployment tools such as uh, automated build servers and things like that, maybe right-click deployment is, is good for you. But most of the time, I gotta say, if your team is probably bigger than yourself, two, three, four, five, X number of developers, right-click de deployments are eventually gonna become a pain. Because there's usually, what usually happens with right-click deployments is one person becomes in charge of deployments, and that person is the one who knows how to deploy out to the, the environment where your application resides. Um, if that person is not available, no deployments happen. Or a uh, different scenario. Let's say uh, five or six different persons do right-click deployments, but it's the environment in machine one, two, three, four, the same as it is in, in, in every single one. Probably not. So whenever we get those deployments out to the cloud or out to whatever your target environment is, you're probably getting a different version or flavor of your app every time a single developer deploys from a different machine. So uh, quick demo there. Again, this not that bad. I mean, in fact, uh, most of this process that I'm going to do right now, I'm going to mimic in PowerShell later. So it's not that the process itself is bad. It's just the... Uh, uh, let's just say how easy it can be corrupted. So let's go ahead and say I'm going to build a deploy to the cloud, so a single app service. Right now, there's nothing out there. I just cre will create one. Right-click deployment 2016. 
Let's create a service plan, same name. And a new research group just because I want it organized. And create. Advantages, I mean everything has an advantage, right? It's very easy to use. Yeah. So if you want to get an application out to the cloud quickly, uh, this is the right way to do it if you're working within the environment of Visual Studio. So I'll just click publish and Visual Studio will take care of business. It will basically restore all the NuGet packages that this application needs. It will uh, compile the application itself. It will package it in a form that uh, uh, will execute faster in the release mode for the server and basically push out those files to the server itself. If this is working correctly, we'll also automatically pop the application up in a browser so that I can actually see if the application is working or not at the time. Um, yep, the simple landing page of, a, of an ASP.NET Core application. And we're going to do the same thing. We're just going to do it in a different manner. We're going to script this whole process uh, using different techniques. We're going to go from as simple as, um, and let me go back here. I want to might not do that anymore. So, so we're going to look up what about what are our alternatives. How can the, how can we make this process better? Uh, another problem with the right-click deployment that I forgot to mention. And that's actually more relevant to what the technology uh, uh, at Microsoft is like at today. The, the right-click deployment, as we saw it, is not cross-platform at this point in time. So if you're working on an ASP.NET Core application uh, that is cr cross-platform, that is going to be hosted on Linux, Ubuntu servers, if that's uh, your target environment, or if you're developing on a Mac and want to push out the applications in right-click deployment, that just doesn't exist. So a lot of the alternatives are also going to fill the gap between how to deploy an application when we're talking about a cross-platform app. So, yep. So this, this, this will, uh, X1 is not small enough. One server, you know, if you have one server where you're going to deploy, uh, but if you have enterprise multiple server, uh, well, right-click deployment, that's also one of its limitations. I mean, if you wanted to deploy to a three-server environment and you were deploying an app service, you were deploying a, the web, and you were deploying a database, you would have to do three different deployments. So if you're scripting and, and automating the whole process, it's going to become an easier, an easier procedure. Uh, that being said, today we're going to focus on just the web app itself. So the alternatives, just to quote them out, I mean, if you go out to Azure and basically uh, Google how to deploy an app on Azure, you'll find that there are basically four different options besides the common right-click deploy, which is you basically can FTP your files up to Azure, uh, what that is simple, all tested, uh, true and tested. Uh, you can either... <clears throat> use a modern deployment service that is based on source code, basically Git, which is called Kudu. Uh, also, you could use uh, MS Deploy. And MS Deploy is the mechanism that is actually used by the right-click publish. And it's actually the one that is commonly most seen out there when we're talking about a scripting and deployment process. Uh, the last one, it's relatively new, especially to the Windows environment and us Microsoft developers, Docker. You could actually deploy to Docker containers in the cloud and uh, basically make your application more efficient in terms of scaling and deployment itself. If we have the time, we're going to do a good Docker demo. That, I'm actually a little bit uh, uh, scared of time management on that one, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. So, uh, FTP, I mean, file transfer protocol. We've all seen it and love it, probably used it in our personal websites and in some uh, applications that we manage out there. Let's just see uh, 
how will we use this as an alternative? Because it is something that you could script. It's just not uh, a technology that is exciting now in 2016. So I'm going to build a simple app. I'm going to generate it using uh, Yeoman, which is the, uh, uh, an open source generator uh, for code. And I could do this one on the PC or on the Mac. There's really no difference. Uh, the only one that has strictly has to happen on the PC is going to be the web deploy. Because again, it's at this point in time, there's no way to do web deploy on a Mac. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a website here, call it Nova CC, and just go to that directory itself. I'm going to do a couple of things just to ensure that the demo works. I'm going to before opening Visual Studio here on the Mac, I'm actually going to uh, restore and build. And open Visual Studio code. So most of the coding today I'm actually going to be doing here. That's one of the things that uh, is going to be predominantly different. Uh, in order to avoid the right-click deploy, I go completely to the other side of the spectrum. I'm not using visualstudio.net in this case at all for this presentation. So let me run this app just to make sure that everything is as expected. I mean, if you haven't used Visual Studio Code, it's a uh, very nice tool. Uh, you can use it in Windows, you can use it on the Mac, on li uh, Linux environments. And uh, it lets you do a lot of the same things that you do in Visual Studio. You can decode, you can uh, debug your code, you can launch the applications and manage applications with multiple projects. So, but for now, just run it. And we should see a screen pop up at some point. You would see that on uh, modern ASP.NET templates. Like when you generate, even within the boundaries of Visual Studio, a new ASP.NET core project, I'm not sure if ASP.NET regular, you always get a Docker file. So that's one of uh, the things that they throw in there to make the whole deployment to a Docker container easier. easier. So this is all that, all that the application does right now. Um, basic hello world. But let me change it a bit so that it becomes a bit more testable during the demo. So I'm going to quit that, going back to Visual Studio Code, and going to add the ability to this project to return static files. Visual Studio is extremely better at this. Because we get some intelligence, as you guys can see, but it's not as good as going through UI to add dependencies. So I'll add that. I'm going to add a index.html file. Let me give it a title. I'm going to make that font bigger. Okay, so a couple of changes in the startup so that it does its work. I, I want to keep that hello world so we have an API to hit, just to make fun, uh, uh, 
to do some fun testing while we're deploying. So I'll just go ahead and move that to a specific path. And I'm going to tell the server to serve static files. All static files that are going to be served are under that www root directory that is over there. So now if I stop this and re-execute this app, same behavior as before, I just see a pop-up come up, uh, just different app. And there's the uh, HTML page that I added to the mix. And there's the API call still returning the hello world. So that's the app. I'm not going to do anything else to it for the, rest of the, uh, uh, for the rest of the demo. So let's deploy it out to the cloud. Now, I'll just exit Safari. Open good old trusty FileZilla. And again, uh, to make this better than a right-click deployment, obviously you want to script this. This is just because it's FTP and I want to get it out of the way. So I'll just create a uh, app service. An empty web app. Let's call it Nova Code Camp. and create a new service plan. That should be relatively quick. So there it is up and running and we have a target FTP. One of the things that you should do if you're going to use this model of deployment or the Kudu model of deployment is always set your credentials. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to just go ahead and assign a, pa a known password. Save that. Let's wait till it's saved. Looks like it's good. Um, get the FTP server out of the uh, configuration. So I'm just going to go ahead and say my host, my username, my password, get a warning that the certificate might not be trusted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I always forget this. I guess this is a good point as any. When you're dealing with users in Azure, even though we had just uh, provided a username that was just a simple name, RJ Hernandez in this case, uh, we always have to add the prefix for the um, target uh, site that we're planning to deploy to. So NovaCC slash RJ Hernandez, and that should connect. Let's see. I will take a go back and redo this.
computers. Um, they sneak up. Okay. Well, thanks. I'll just say that. They sneak that P on me. Let's see. And yes, I accept all type of help. <laughs> Hard enough as it is. Okay. So. I'll just go to the project itself here. Sorry about the uh, small font size here, but it's just going to be a bunch of files. So demo, and that's the folder that we have been working on right now. And we're going to deploy that. But uh, one of the things that you always want to do in, uh, before deploying your app is basically compile it and get rid of the source code. So uh, if you were doing this on the uh, Windows environment, there'd be two choices. If you're working with a... Uh, .NET Framework app, uh, you would just use MS Build to do so. If you're working on a ASP.NET Core app, you can use either MS Build or .NET to actually do the work. So I'll just go ahead and do .NET Publish. And just because I don't remember it exactly, I'll do help. And there's the dash dash output. And I'm going to tell it to deploy all the code to this deployments slash app folder. And let's see what we got. So here, I'll refresh. We should have a. Should be dot backslash deployments. Yep. For the demo, I guess it works as it is. I can fix that later. But uh, so this is the compile project itself. Now, uh, if you've heard uh, something. Uh, anything about .NET Core, you'll know that one of the things about it is that it's portable. So that's why you see those ton, ton of libraries there, Microsoft.extension, System.NET, because basically this application can run on its own. It doesn't really need to bring along the .NET framework for it to work. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy all those files to site.root. That should be fairly quick. See, internet has been surprisingly good today. And I'll just retrieve that from Azure. And there we go. And just for Let's call the Hello World just to see if it's still out there. So yeah, FTP is a viable method of getting uh, your Azure website up to the cloud. It is scriptable. It's just not cool in 2016. Uh, that's, that's my only opinion on it, I got, I got to admit. There are much better ways of doing this nowadays. So building on top of that, we're now going to move on. Let me just make that bigger. To the next alternative, Kudu. Now, Kudu is much, much more than a mechanism to deploy your application. Kudu is actually a full set of uh, debugging, uh, tracing, managing your application once it's deployed to the cloud. But it also provides the mechanism through source code of being able to deploy your application to the cloud and customizing what happens when you deploy the application itself. So uh, in fact, if you're a lone wolf developer, uh, this is the approach that I would recommend nowadays. If you're managing an application on Azure and you don't want to have the code hosted in uh, GitHub for X, Y, or Z reasons or Bitbucket or any of the other uh, free repository source codes that are out there. So Kudu, what are we going to do? We're going to be basically pushing out code to the cloud. Let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> so last thing here, I'm going to delete everything that uh, 
that was deployed just to make sure that just to keep me honest right there we go that's empty and we actually can close file Scylla. there's not not more use for it there so at the Azure level in the app the credentials that I'm going to use to deploy using kudu are going to be the same that I will be using when doing FTP so we're covered there as long as I don't uh, have another typo so what do we need to do I'll go into deployment options and we'll see that there are uh, different things that I can authorize for deploy automatic deployments into Azure so I could have a GitHub repository source my uh, host my source code and every time I check in it would be automatically deployed to the cloud I could host my code which is what I'm gonna do now at a local git repository in the cloud uh, so when they say local it's local to the cloud uh, and that will be automatically deployed as soon as I push so a lot of options the other one that I'm gonna do today just to go through the list is the one on the top I'm probably not gonna go through the wizard I'm gonna do some scripting but this is also one of the options we're gonna be talking about so I'll just hit local git repository and do OK. Now on the overview page, there's now a git clone URL and a git deployment username. Uh, the git deployment username is the same one we had when we were doing the FTP deployments. But I'll just copy paste the one for git in order to get uh, the code that I have out and deploy to the cloud. So let me just do uh, a list to see what I have here. I'm just going to go ahead and initialize a repository here. And there we go. I'm, I'm going to uh, delete that folder, deployments app. and let's see what we got in git so that's the application I'm gonna commit everything first commit Oops. okay first commit now we have everything committed to the cloud well not to the cloud sorry to my local repository of my machine I'm now going to add a remote to Azure in order to do the deployment. So get remote, and you can use any uh, visual, tool, visual tool to do this. For example, my favorite tool uh, in the OS X or Windows environment is uh, the Adelation uh, source tree, which is great for interacting with Mercurial or Git repositories. Is that a free tool? It is. It is. It's one. It's yeah, it's one of the free tools that they have under the whole Adelation products umbrella. So I'll add a remote. I'm going to call it Azure and paste the remote address. At this point, I can do a git push origin Azure. And I'm also going to go over here just to show you one thing uh, here in this environment. Uh, this I have integration into Git, so there you can manage your Git uh, commits, stagings, etc. through the uh, uh, user interface of Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio. But the funny thing here, since this is built for this type of work, is that you get a publish. Now it knows that I have a remote named Asher, and by convention it knows that if I click publish, it's going to go out to the cloud. So it's exactly the same work that I'm doing here when I say, hey, push to the origin, Asher. Now, a lot of things are going to happen when I do this, or not. Thank you. Azure Master. That's better. It should have asked me for my password, but obviously I've practiced the demo a bit, so it's probably caching my uh, keys. So all that noise is not Git. 
that's actually replay of, of things that are happening on the server right now. So it's basically restoring all the NuGet packages that the application needs to run. So all the compilation, all the pre-published, post-published tasks that are defined for this project to work are actually being executed on the Azure right now, and I can see the log on this end. Uh, because we added a remote that targets Azure and Azure is repeating information to us. It could have been a different name. The only thing we would not have gotten if we named it something else, uh, I don't know, a repository, a, git, uh, a remote called John or something. The only thing we wouldn't have gotten is the publish button on uh, Visual Studio Code because it wouldn't have identified it as an Azure remote. A couple of things are happening out there on the cloud. I can actually see some of those. I'm going to move to the other screen. Uh, where's my browser? Here. So Kudu. I mentioned that Kudu was more than a uh, mechanism to deploy an application. So basically, if you use the URL of your app and just add the SCM, within the Azure Dog websites and the name of your application, you enter to the Kudu website itself. And here, I could basically see, uh, although I did that on the other website, but I could see the Git repository information, source control info, through their API. Uh, but I can also see, which is something I was doing through FTP earlier, uh, the file structure out on that server. And right now, site has a new folder that it didn't have before, or a couple of new folders actually. It has a logs and it has a repository and a deployments. Before we only had a dot dot root and we basically dump information through FTP in there. But now the repository actually has our source code. So that's where this the repository, the git target git repository actually lives. So all this uh, work that uh, is finished at this point of compiling and copying actually is dumped into the dub dub root. So we have exactly the same process that we had before. It's just different in terms of where the code is being hosted right now. And if I go to, wait, I didn't do the silly things. The silly things are important in the presentation. So let's just add kudu there. Uh, the process is going to be not as intense as it was before. Let's call this uh, change title, commit, and publish. Now that's going to take, uh, again, less time than it did the time that before because now we're not pushing out that much code. It's just a difference between a commit and the other. Plus the same thing happens with the compilation. We're not replacing as many files. We're just replacing a single file. Uh, it looks like the push already happened. It's actually a way to visualize it here. I'm not 100% sure how. We could we could look at the file, but I mean, uh, for the deployment. Well, yes, and here are the deployments, but like uh, that's one of the plus on Kudu. Kudu has really very good tool support. So deployment options should give me the two deployments that we did. I'm, I'm guessing that's what you mean from, we can also see that in Kudu, right, in terms of deployments. Yeah, well, if, you, if you go to the site, there is a deployment tools. Yep. Yeah. We'll push something else, see it go through. We use that lock stream uh, screen a lot for tracing and debugging. 
we do we dump the information of the offer tracer directly into that. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> So I'll leave this running and come back to it in a second. So uh, that is Kudu. There is one more thing that I want to show you, which is basically this whole process is customizable. So it's not just, hey, uh, this works. It's a black box. We can't do anything about it. But if you've ever built a web app, you know that there are many things that need to happen. For example, uh, you might need to compile your JavaScript. So if you have an Angular uh, single page application that uses Angular 1 or Angular 2, you might want to uh, minimize that and put it in a single file and, uh, well, again, one of many things that you could be doing. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and show you how you would actually go about that. So if I go ahead, there's a, there's a tool and it's one of the tools that you should get familiar with if you're working on Azure deployments using Kudu is, is the Azure CLI. The Azure CLI is completely cross-platform, so I could use it here, I could use it on the Windows side, really doesn't make a difference. But uh, I actually already have it installed, so I shouldn't, go, I shouldn't try to install it again. I'll just go ahead and execute Azure uh, site, ask for a little help. So, not all commands are documented. Deployment scripts is one of them. So I'll just do that. Deployment script. Yep, deployment script. And I'm going to tell her to generate a deployment script for a ASP.NET Core website. Deployment. And to me, it's silly that it's actually asking me for a file name because by convention, that is the file that Kudu is going to use. So why does it even need to ask me what the name of the file is? So the file is created. I'll just go ahead into Visual Studio Code right here and uh, show it to you guys. There's this deployment file which just says, hey, what should I do when uh, a build starts to happen? And as you can see, it's simple. In this case, what you're saying, when it happens, simply run deploy.cmd. Uh, we could change this if you guys wanted to run something different, like if you guys are fans of PowerShell, want to write a, uh, a uh, PowerShell script that basically does a ton of other things, you could do that. If you, this was a, uh, a single page application and all you needed to do was gulp, then gulp it is. But out of the box, basically calls the deploy.cmd command. And this is the deploy cmd command as, as added by the Azure CLI tool. So this is the script that basically builds your app. There is documentation out there in terms of um, the best ways to modify this, uh, because of course you don't want to get too fancy, but it's good to know that you have the ability to do so. Pause this. Doesn't want to work. <laughs> oh, the lock stream. All right. So the next one, MS deploy. So uh, MS deploy, and this is where you're probably going to get most value about on the presentation today. Uh, MS Deploy is the same mechanism used by right-click deployments. And it's the same mechanism you would use to, for example, to deploy to an IIS web server if you're scripting the uh, uh, deployment of your application. So let's go ahead and see what's the best way to use MS Deploy. And for now, we're just going to script it. Later on, when we're talking about tools, we're going to automate it.
and yes, there are plans for Microsoft to build over uh, to the uh, 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 to build as cross-platform apps, MS Build, MS Deploy. So the whole range of products required to interact with the .NET framework. MS Deploy basic MS Deploy and Web Deploy are I don't want to call them the same product because they're not, but MS Deploy basically relies on Web Deploy in order to do its work. So I'm gonna move to the Windows environment. And I already have the file here, but let's say I don't. I wasn't supposed to be there. I haven't seen anything. Okay, so if you're going to script the, an application in order to deploy to the cloud, the one thing you're going to need, and this is uh, in the documentation for uh, Microsoft Visual Studio deployments right now or ASP.NET Core deployments, uh, you're going to need the PowerShell modules to interact with Web Deploy. Uh, why? Because it makes things easier. There's this guy at Microsoft, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Sa Sayid I uh, Ibrahim, I think. And he is the one who deploys all this wonderful tool. So one of the things that he actually has done since he became me a member of Microsoft's MS Build team is he uh, has actually uh, separated things that were exclusive to Visual Studio into also open source products. So for example, the published modules that were exclusive uh, as part of the install that came with Visual Studio, now you can download them as NuGet packages. So that opens a bit the uh, capabilities of what you can do when it comes to deploying your application. It's still the same thing that Visual Studio is doing, it's just that we're not relying on the file that came with Visual Studio, we're just going to NuGet and tell him, hey, give me the latest one. So there are a couple of things here that I'm not gonna delete. Let me get rid of a couple of folders though. Well, and let's outline the strategy before I go ahead and do it. So I'm going to restore what is called the Publish Module 1.1.1. That, that's the latest Microsoft Publish Module for PowerShell that allows you to interact with Web Deploy and uh, MS Deploy. After that, I'm going to package the application itself. Step in the middle. I'm going to import the module before I use it. It's always important. I'm going to package the application and I'm going to deploy the application itself. So first things first, in this machine, and uh, it's for my convenience, uh, I already have NuGet in the path. So that might be different when it comes to scripting your own environments. Just take that into account as I'm, as I'm writing this. So I'm just going to go ahead and say NuGet And gonna call install on this packages done config file that's already there. The only uh, thing that's in there is the publish that module version one 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 one. So I'm gonna go ahead and say packages dot config output directory. Deployments slash packages. And I th let's see. Let's just go ahead and execute that. I am in the right folder. And I'm just going to call deploy. Now my packages, now I have the published module that I need. So now I need to import it. It is a cumbersome path import module. I believe all I need is deployments, packages, publish modules, one dot one dot one slash tools slash publish module dot PSM one. Just double check. 
Yep. That looks about right. So I'm going to package the application. And these are the same commands I were using in a Mac. I'm going to .NET restore in order to make sure that the packages that it needs are available. And I'm going to .NET publish it. And that's also going to ask for help here because I don't remember the specific parameter. Dash dash output. So dash dash output. And I'm going to tell it to deploy to the deployments folder slash app. Now let's see if this runs to this point. Okay, there's the app, and if I look at it, uh, just to double check, there is a bug, believe it or not, that if you use the dash O option instead of the dash dash output, it doesn't give you the dot dot root. It's a very fun bug. But hey, it seems like my PowerShell's not that bad today. So the last option, and I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to pretend that I can type this. I'm going to look it up in my demo notes, and not that one. And there we go. The publish ASP.NET module is what I get from the publish module dash 1.1.1.1. And basically here I'm telling you, hey, there's a packed output at deployment slash app. I want it to deploy to novacc.scm. That's the Kudu website. Ironically, the web deploy also goes through Kudu. Uh, SSL deployment, so I want it to be secure. I want it to delete the existing files. Uh, skip existing files on the server, false. And the only thing that I don't have right now, because this is old, this is probably from last night, is the correct password. So I'm going to go ahead to my, uh, let's do it within Visual Studio. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to go ahead and get from, let's see, from Nova Code Camp. And, well, first things first, uh, that's why you practice for demos. So deployment options, if I leave this like it is right now, connected to the source control as the way to deployment, I'm going to be in a lot of pain. So I'm going to disconnect it so that the web deployments work correctly. So it's already showing me setup. It means that the disconnected probably work. I'll give it another try. Uh, deployment options, and it looks good. It's already back to what it was at the beginning. So back to overview. Okay. Back to overview. Uh, now I don't have the Git credentials as a means of deployment here. What I'm going to download, and there are two ways to do this. Like this is the uh, straightforward way. We're downloading basically a published profile that has a username and password that we can use to deploy to the cloud. But what I usually recommend to, uh, to our customers is uh, don't use this mechanism because there's a hard-coded username and password that you'll need to manage. You, I prefer to download a published profile for the whole subscription that creates a trust between the server that's building the applications and Azure itself, the Azure subscription. So there's no need for username and password just a certificate that manages the trust relation. So I'm going to download the Provish profile. And right, that, that's also one mechanism. Yeah. But at that point, oh, that's the way that you get, if you're using the certificate, that's how you get the credentials. That's, that's how you avoid them being hard-coded. But you have to already be authenticated to Azure to get the credentials. So you authenticate it through the certificate instead of a user. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to steal the password from here. Wow. Long bundle of joy. Oops.
and dump that there. So this folder deployments, uh, I think I already did it, but I'm going to check if it's ignored from source control because that's it, we're going to use the same solution to to do the demo of automating the whole process, and I don't want that de deployments folder to be a pain when we get to that part. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and run that deploy the PowerShell. Let's see if I can make. And there we go, huge font, and the password. And MS Deploy, that's fine. Right now, I believe it says Kudu, right? So. So there we go. The NuGet package gets restored. Uh, loading the module, and I believe that last line it's already MS Deploy Web Deploy doing its magic. And everybody has been deployed. So going back to the browser and refreshing we should get the MS Deploy option right there. Obviously, this is the best way uh, for you to script the deployment of your application. And, uh, and not only on the, on the Windows side, there is, it's still in beta, but there is a, uh, a project to actually take PowerShell into the uh, Linux environments themselves. I don't know how much the uh, Bash lovers are gonna feel about that, but. Mm -hmm. But at least for us, Windows developers, I mean, I, I identify myself as a Windows developer. I've been on the stack since 1990-something. Uh, this is great news for me because it's a language that I manage, and I know it's very powerful when it comes to scripting. So, <clears throat> so let's see. Okay. So my recommendation... Um, is let's come back to Docker after we do the full automation. Uh, just because, again, uh, you'll get probably more bang out of your buck by watching the full automation happen on Visual Studio Online than uh, on Docker itself. I do have the, the environment ready, so we are going to do the demo on Docker, but let's move first to uh, the enterprise strategy. And, uh, and again, the reason why we took a peek at all these different alternatives. I mean, right-click, like I mentioned at the beginning, it's not an enterprise strategy. So we now know that we can either use FTP, Kudu, MS Deploy, or Docker, and we'll get back to it, as our enterprise strategy to deploy applications out to the Microsoft Cloud. Uh, knowing this set of tools allows us to, and, uh, and this is a, a documentation that is probably old at this point, but uh, uh, this was uh, at least five years back. I mean, everybody wanted to be on the bandwagon of we want to do continuous integration. Every single checking of our app needs to go through quality control. We believe that as a company, and we actually do it at Inferno Red. The same thing with continuous delivery, although that is a uh, uh, goal that is harder to reach. So every single checking that we do in, in our application, if it goes successfully to the continuous integration process, it is ready as a deliverable out to the to the uh, customer hand as a matter of minutes. So continuous delivery is the ability to the, the, uh, uh, basically put the, app, the fe new features into the hands of our application uh, users as soon as possible. And continuous integration from this perspective will be the quality control that we do on top of it. And what makes uh, for a good continuous integration strategy and delivery strategy? Knowing the tools that would allow you to get there. So. All the tools that we mentioned are scriptable. Those are valid tools to get us into the enterprise strategy, or to build a successful enterprise strategy. And that's actually what I have on the next slide. It's just a brief summary of the tools of the trade when it comes to doing implementing an enterprise strategy for delivering an application to the cloud. 
So the command line scripting tools, that, uh, there are values, so PowerShell, uh, straight up CMD or bad DOS scripts, uh, batch itself, and your build servers. We all have our favorite build server. Uh, me, I love, to, I love Team City, uh, and I love to hate on Jenkins. But Visual Studio Online is free and it's out there, and it is what we're going to actually do as a demo. It's not longer called Visual Studio Online. In fact, I made an emphasis on calling it what it is today, Visual Studio Team Services, um, which is basically a hosted solution of Visual Studio Team System. So let's go ahead and do a demo that basically involves one of those tools. So I'm going to do a couple of things here uh, to get us going. And let's discuss the strategy first. So what we have in the PowerShell, it's good in the sense that it works as a deployment mechanism out to the, to the cloud. I am going to make a couple of changes. Why? Because number one, I don't, if I was building this, I probably wouldn't want to have, um, and I probably wouldn't want to have the username and password hard coded or the website that I'm targeting out on the cloud. Because uh, I think there was a question about deploying to multiple environments when we started, right? And that's one of the mechanisms that's going to allow you basically create flexible deployment scripts. So let's just start doing that. Let's just go ahead and define a set of parameters that are going to make uh, deploying easier. So first things first, let's define a parameter for a website. And wrong case. Let's define a parameter for our user. Uh, parameter for password and an extra and this is because I know that what I'm doing here in this line is not going to work out of the box on, on the build server so I'm going to actually build in a bit of flexibility here in the sense that I'm going to create a parameter where I'm going to toggle uh executing this line of code or not and again that's a uh, probably I, I probably could have done that better it's just a matter of uh, getting demo code to work quickly so this line of code all executes when do nuget equals true and now we want to make sure that we deploy to the right website user password so let's go down here and this is our website. This is our website. This is our user. And last thing. Or password. Yep, that looks about right. So now that I have that, I'm going to actually deploy this code out to uh, a Visual Studio Online project that I already created for us. So let me see. Don't believe this is part of any new uh, any Git repository already. So I'll just go ahead and do a git init. And there we go. I'm going to add everything. And I'm going to commit this as first. Now, I currently don't have any remotes. Oops. Yep, I don't have any remotes, so that's what I'm going to be adding right now. Um, browser, let's go there. Many screens. So 
So here we are. I knew I had it someplace. So this project called Beyond Right Click, I'm actually going to deploy the source code here. I've already created a Git repository, a project where I'm going to be able to build, uh, do builds and releases, etc. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this, uh, which is a target Git. And same thing we did before, remote add, I'm going to call it origin this time, just because that's going to be my default repository. And that should work. Now I'm going to push, push this out to the to, to Visual Studio Team services. And let's check what we got. And that looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and create the build. And I'm going to start up with an empty build. So this build is going to be based on the Beyond Right Click repository. You have the ability to create multiple repositories within a uh, uh, Visual Studio Team Services project and it's based on this branch. So it already has a note here, it says, uh, should I basically trigger this every time there's a checking? Sure. And which agent? A hosted free agent. It's gonna take a little bit more time than uh, I would hope for demo purposes, but uh, I'm not paying for the agent. So create. And there we have an empty build definition. Let's start adding steps. So first things first, since we're going to be using our already famous PowerShell uh, file, we have to do the NuGet work. So NuGet installer, we're going to add it. Say does install. And we're going to pass it the uh, deployments. Actually, oh, that was a mistake on my part. Um, I actually need to, um, let's see. So this file right here, even though it's part of a folder that I w don't want to check in, I do want to check in this file. And we have to force it because uh, I need that file when I'm going to run my uh, restore. So added NuGet packages.config. And let's push that to master. And there we are. That was quick. So NuGet arguments, we know that there's a dot stash output directory. Let us see. So going back to Visual Studio Code, there's a, let's see, dash output directory and packages. I'm just saying packages because the way this works, and uh, I guess you can only find this out through uh, pain, it's because we're saying that the file exists in that deployments folder, it's going to basically execute off of that deployments folder. It's a hidden feature, I guess. So that looks good. I'm going to add another step. So the second step would actually be um, you see, we're doing the NuGet install. Now we uh, run our file. So PowerShell. Mm, not Azure PowerShell, but PowerShell. And 
And here we have our deploy.ps1 file and we have a bunch of arguments that we need to set. So we have and file and error. The user itself, which is, uh, I'm going to have to go ahead and uh, get it from this file. Username, uh, dollar sign, Nova CC. Let's do that. Uh, yeah, the deploy.ps1 should, should, should match what we have here. Well, it's it's uh, right now I'm, I'm relying on the, the same as I defined them here. So Nova CC website it really doesn't matter here. Nova CC. Uh, password, that's the long password. And you nougat. I'm sorry? No, I shouldn't, they should match by convention. There it is. That dollar sign? Yeah. Yep. What do you mean it's for the user and not the admin for the website? Oh, um. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> so I think do nougat is the only thing I'm missing. And do nougat. False. Let's call this deploy. So there are other things we can do with this, but let's just leave it at this for now and test it. So I did have a lot of fun testing this this morning. So triggers is right now continuous integration. Build, we'll run the NuGet, and we'll run the PowerShell script. Uh, it's all that it's doing at this point. Uh, dash dash output directory. Let me just validate that with what I have on the deploy.powershell. It's actually single dash. And, well, let's give it a try. Let's go ahead and change the index.html to say Visual Studio Team Services. Let's see, add that file, change label, hit push or even master, and that should trigger the build. So now, when I go to build, I should be able to see one in progress. I can actually go see the new build results. And this should bring the stream of the output of the build in a second or two. And there we go.
you might deploy the app anyway because there's really not a uh, uh, the the PowerShell script is not stopping at that point. Yeah, the uh, well, it's still not deploying because uh, this is where actually there's this is going to spend a bit of time doing so because this is a hosted uh, Visual Studio Team System build agent. Uh, it doesn't have the .NET Core already uh, compiled on demand like it needs to be, so that's what's actually expending actually more cycles on. It's not horribly long. So let's see, it seems like I messed up the parameters. I mean, this is way to test this just to go ahead and right right So, I mean, I didn't like the fact that the NuGet didn't work. Uh, it is getting horribly close to 215, but let's give it one more chance here. The irony. So, yeah, I mean, the, what's happening now? I think we're getting a false error, and it's because uh, the NuGet packages is uh, it's not getting deployed as it should. But that's basically it. But uh, I mean, one thing I can't do is hold you any longer. <laughs> there is somebody who's got, got probably going to be at this room after we are. Um, so, with that. Let me go back to what we had here. So this is my favorite slide. Let me see, where is it? Yeah, well actually no, this one isn't my favorite slide. This one's my favorite slide. Yeah. So with that, I mean, we're done with the whole topic. We're, I'm not gonna get a chance to go over Docker. Uh, it is a small demo. If you guys wanna look at uh, Docker in action, I can actually, uh, uh, over by the IRT booth, probably uh, give you a slight tour of how it works. It's really simple to use from the Azure perspective because um, the complexity with Docker actually resides on 
managing the server, container, uh, the whole different pieces that make uh, uh, Docker work. And Azure actually provides two different ways to do this. You can actually have an Azure VM with an extension of Docker installed on it, which is uh, what I would call the uh, simple solution. And or you, there's actually a complete offering in Azure called Azure Container Services, which is more like an enterprise solution where you have an array of VMs and you can deploy to your containers to many, as many VMs as you want. The real advantage there, and that's why it's such a hot topic, uh, Docker, Docker, Docker everywhere, is that MS deployments and um, building Azure websites is a relatively slow process, just because Azure has to provision so many things for it to happen. So even when you're saying, when my website hits uh, 100%, basically go from two to four machines, there's a lag. There's a certain amount of time that, that's gonna, that it's gonna take to happen for the scaling to work and for your clients to see the performance boost of the scaling. So Docker, because it's much, much simpler unit that we're scaling, just the container, not the whole uh, Azure App Service as a product, then it becomes real easy to go from two to n number of containers in really quick time. So, again, if you want to talk a bit more Docker, I'm definitely willing. So, here are some of the resources. Uh, I mean, don't go crazy. Take a picture if you want to, but don't go crazy with that because uh, we're really, uh, we're, we have the slides out of speaker deck. Yep. And all the code that I actually use today, it's going to be here at bitbucket.com slash overwrite this. Overwrite this is my blog, and uh, that's where I basically put all the demos usually. So, thank you for your patience. I hope this was extremely fun for you as it was for me. And if you have any questions, I'm here for you.